Welcome to Data Warehouse Automation Using Agile Methods. My name is Thomas LeBlanc, currently a product manager for some software that does data warehouse automation uh, in a lot of different industries. Um, before we get started with this session, let's uh, explore a little thing, little things about PASH you might want to know about. Um, there's a new membership. You actually, most of the memberships are free, but you do have a pro membership. Now you can pay. You get some exclusive stuff normally, not with the free account. Um, of course, you always have access to local user groups in this time and age right now. We're kind of limited in what we can do with local groups. But um, once it gets started up, you can actually go to SQL Saturdays, which are free days of training on a Saturday. There's some virtual ones been a member and helped moderate and talk at many past marathons and I've helped out with different virtual groups but to get involved with this community is not very difficult and should go to past.org and try to try to fit your way into this wonderful community of data platform technologists of course what we need you to do is to go to the session evaluation and uh, if you do this, they actually have some giveaways. I actually won a $50 gift card one time, so I uh, don't think you'll get left out. Um, your feedback is important. I know as a speaker and many other speakers, you'll see them tweeting, um, especially if they get good um, <laughs> feedback. But of course, uh, we'll take some constructive criticism and try to improve our um, sessions. So my name is Thomas LeBlanc. Um, in my third year of being an MVP, I consider myself a SQL Server architect. The automation company is named Warescape. I do the product management to the um, design side of the automation tool. It's a really cool product. Some people used to label me as a data database normalization nut. I meant uh, if you didn't have your database in uh, at least third, if not fourth or fifth normal form, you got the wrath. Of Thomas upon you. The problem was is developers weren't listening to me and it kind of fell on deaf ears. So I, I moved over to data warehousing and business intelligence. And you can say I got a little crazy about dimensional modeling and the Kimball methodology and used it for at least a decade. I consider myself a retired developer. I started in COBOL, RBase, Fox Pro, um, VB, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and 6 before the .NET came out, but I retired and went into the data area first as a DBA and now in data warehousing. I actually got Data Vault uh, 2 certification last year, um, which was interesting. Um, it's a whole new methodology, which I, now I'm starting to adapt to more and more. You can find me on Twitter, Gmail, and blog, um, The Smiling DBA. Um, you can find, uh, you can contact me in many ways with that. As a past volunteer, I have chaired the Data Architect as well as the Excel BI virtual chapters. I was on the nomination committee for the board 2016 and 17. And I'm involved with the local SQL Server as well as now the analytics user groups. And I got to chair the um, 2020 SQL Saturday BI edition um, and analytics. A lot of it was involved with analytics here in Baton Rouge. And that was probably one of the last weekends um, in, in March of last year that live SQL Saturdays were able to um, ha happen. And we were very happy. We had about 150, 200 people there. So um, what's our agenda today? So first, we're going to just talk briefly about what Agile Data Warehouse might be. Um, I think everybody's going to have a different idea about it. We'll flow into the ideas of dimensional modeling and then kind of morph into Data Vault, which in my opinion is a little better in agile type development. And we'll see examples along the way. And we'll talk about the in incremental approach and we'll look at what can be uh, put on top of, including uh, a Data Vault or um, a dimensional model or what like Dan Lynch would like to say is a uh, information mark. Um, the, the, the definition of data warehousing is very wide today. Um, there's the term modern data warehouse, which now includes um, cloud as well as big data. Um, so it's a, it's a huge industry. We're going to try to concentrate on one little area of it. And uh, now we'll look at the agile methodology. So back in the, back in the days, 
when this started, there was a manifesto. And uh, I thought, and what I interpreted from the beginnings of Agile, was you were trying to develop in little chunks, um, little areas. Uh, you, you made the development smaller, 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 um, especially with object-oriented programming, so you could you could find out if things worked at such a granular level. And a lot of this um, morphed into a, more of a project management style, which your Scrum development. Um, and uh, they 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 kind of lost the waterfall terminology for it, but it's kind of a, it's still kind of circular. Um, but you might start off with these huge user stories and progress to themes, and then you might get you know detailed into the work that needs to be done. One big deal is you have if you have a group of people is that you get a, you get people to uh, put a number on a particular task. Um, one thing. Um, you know, not to be afraid of Agile is, you know, sometimes a, a, a sprint itself doesn't even produce something you send to a customer. It could be six sprints before you actually push a deployment out um, that's actually usable by um, your end users. In the data realm, that might be different if you have some uh, hardcore, um, their business users, really their um, more of a high-level user that understands the structure. It, it gets real confusing too because you you might give them access to your ODS and then they start querying it and then they never use your data mart or your data vault and you're stuck with them sitting in the um, area you want to get rid of. So um, that's kind of a what is agile today. Personally, it's you know whatever you want to call your development cycle. I mean that's my opinion. You know, and it boils down to a couple things. In my my humble opinion, opinion is smaller dev cycles. You want smaller units of work, and you in because of a smaller unit of work, you might get better estimates from your developers and and people involved in the project as they go through the different cycles. So you can improve upon it in each individual sprint that you're going through. It's results driven. So it might not be anything for the client, but there's there's a result. I'm going to write this code to produce this data in this particular table, or I'm going to write this function that's going to be used throughout it, or I'm not going to put, um, I'm going to put the raw data in, I'm going to wait to put the um, the business layer on top of it that the end user can actually um, use. And then, you know, you, your leader wants these measurable blocks of work. You know, some people do sprints two uh, weeks. I know the first one I really was involved with in a business intelligence for healthcare was um, about six weeks. And uh, they wanted to reduce it to two weeks. We argued against them. That's more for dev, not for, for data. But um, it's all up to you, you know, what you want to set it. You work with your group. Um, and it's just what you level. What you want to do is establish something that every everybody consistently uses, that they don't fall off the mark. So, you know, in, in the data warehouse world, there's some big methodologies um, that come into play. Iman was the first one. It was this full data warehouse. You design and implement everything all at one time. It seems to me, though, now that Iman was, was, he was way uh, before his time. And people that were able to do this um, excelled and, uh, and then once they developed it, they had a, a lock in their job for an awful long time. Dimensional modeling came out. You might hear the word data marts, um, facts with conformed dimensions. So you're just hub and spokes type thing where you're developing these smaller data marts. They have dimensions around a fact or facts. And then those dimensions can be shared between data marts that you develop. So in the agile world, you can develop individual data marts, hook them all together which you conform to mention, and that could be an agile development. The idea behind the data marts was to get something to the end user quicker than what the I'm in full data warehouse was. And everybody has their opinions on this. Data Vault is just something called hubs, links, and satellites. And what I really like about it is fully audible and adaptable. And we'll see as we flow through here at how this uh, comes into play. I'm not saying this one is better than all the rest, but it seems that Data Vault um, has a good hook into the agile development life cycle. You know, um, all of its work, you know, you, you want to pick a team. Um, if I had time to select which uh, 
type of data warehouse I would want. Um, I think I'd plan on a data vault. Um, you know, you get this little picture in the upper right, and it's the reds are the links, the blues are the hubs, and the yellows are the satellites. And it's it's kind of very, very easy to view. It's not hard on the eyes. Um, not as easy as a star schema or snowflake schema, but if I had the time, that's what I would do. I would develop uh, a data vault. And of course, you know, in our questions and answers at the end, um, you could send in a question and we, we could talk about it and um, see where your idea might be um, better than, than the data vault idea. So let's go ahead and jump straight into a data vault example. And what we're going to do is we're going to go from a source and we're going to show how we can relate um, categories to products with kind of an intermediary that's going to tell us what the relationship between those are. So here are, is our, um, we're in a, a database called Northwind and um, we have a connection to the source which displays um, the structure of these tables. So this is our category table, it shows us the schema and database, the different columns um, that we have inside of the database, along with their, their data types, a normal just kind of an entity relationship type diagram or data diagram. Well, our product has a category ID. It also has a supplier ID. So it has two relationships. And what we want to do is we want to build um, something from this little area right here. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a logical type model with this. So I'm going to go ahead and um, work off my displayed view here. And I'm going to create one of these logical models. And I'll call it uh, NW um, Sprint 1. So in my Sprint 1, I've got some definitions of what I call satellites, or really their attribute types that could create a satellite. And I'm creating um, a logical representation of my hub. So my hub name is product, and my key is product ID. Now, inside of Data Vault, you might look for more of a unique um, name rather than an ID because the ID can change, especially if you have different systems that come together. So the ID generated in one system might not be the same as the other. So instead of ID, you might want to reference name instead. And now we'll add also for a um, for a uh, relationship with the product hub is our category hub. So we have a product and category, and we're going to put a link between those two. And we'll call it product category. And it's going to be those two hubs. So we're creating actually three tables in this relationship. And it's going to ask us what that attribute name maps to our source. So category name, and then product name. So now we have the two systems, uh, two areas. We're bringing them together. And um, inside of Data Vault, there might be a link dependency child. We'll talk about this more when we get into more of a transactional style. These are all lookup tables, so we don't have anything currently that would cause that. Now, for our category, we're going to remove the picture. We don't want that in there. And then on our product, we're going to remove some of the numeric types. Um, we're going to keep the, the IDs for relationships and some general things about quantity per unit, unit price. But on our link, we're going to add that discontinued reorder level, uh, units or on order, and units in stock. So we have two hubs, and then we have a link between the two hubs. So now I'm using some metadata stored for these items to generate some tables. It's really logical right now. Um, but what I'm really looking at here now is more of the satellite information for those. We're going to close, click Next, and then we have a final review of how we want to handle the data. So for instance, inside, and we'll talk more about this, um, you might have things that have different volatilities. For instance, the, the volatility of our product, supplier, and category might not change that often, but quantity per unit and unit price 
might change a little more often. So what this is, is it gives us the ability on our hub a product to have a satellite of columns that don't change frequently separated from the ones that do change frequently. And this is really the part of the Agile system. So here in my category hub, I'm going to go look at my attributes. So now I've got attribute types. Category name is my business key. The ID is a medium satellite. My description is a medium. I might not even want category ID inside of here. I'm going to keep it just for the reference or I might even rename it instead of it being category ID. Maybe it's the particular system, Northwind category ID. But here I'm trying to keep it as granular as possible. The link between them, instead of being a business key, is a link business key. And then our additional attributes for that are called satellite transactions. So now we have a different type of satellite table that can be created. The product looks pretty much the same as a category, except these three have one satellite volatility, where the other two are a little more um, volatile, meaning they change more frequency. So I have a logical model here that was based off my physical model. We didn't do the suppliers. We're going to show how we can agile add this in a little while. But this is my sprint one and I now want to actually generate um, a data vault from it. So I'm going to call this MW sprint one. Might misspell some of that, but that's okay. Y'all get the idea. I'm just creating these models along with a sprint number so I know where I'm at. It's going to ask me for some uh, to generate some of this code or generate some of the design of it. And what I get here is a nice data vault designed with the hub for satellite, H underscore category. I have a link product category. That's the relationship between H category and H product. I have one satellite on my hub and then I have some additional satellites for my product and also for my transaction. And you also notice here we have um, two different ones for product. One's a low LROC and one's an M for medium volatility. So what we've done is we've created a design logically that now can actually be deployed I'm sorry, this is actually the physical design of the table that can be deployed. Now, one thing also you'll notice is that it added some additional fields. DS record source, load date, and create time. So all of our tables have flags on them that can be logged for when things change. Even inside of the satellite, we have a hash of the change of the two um, attributes in the satellite. You'll also notice the attributes are in the satellite and the only one that's in the category is that business key. And the key now of the table is going to be a hash of that category name. So that's a good section of our first sprint which now can be deployed and populated based on the metadata that's been stored with these items. So after looking at that product and category, let's talk a little more about some of these agile changes that we're going to see in a data warehouse versus, let's say, in a dimensional model. So we did our sprint one. It was basically just to get the product and category together. There were no other relationships that we, we created, um, but down the road you'll see um, order line will be related to the product. It doesn't directly relate to the category, but through the product, now we have a link between product and category, and we can add that to the order line. Now, it'll need the product along with probably an order header, and it would be the same option here. You would create a link that is the relationship between the hubs. So if you see a pattern here now, your hubs are mainly those business objects whether it be a lookup table or a transactional table, they all become hubs which are connected through links. And we also saw that we could put satellites on those link tables. And we're going to do a query in just a second. So a quick review of this um, 
it might be called, you might hear the term raw data vault now rather than just data vault itself. Um, so that uh, starts with a hub. And to create a hub, you need a business key. You need a unique identifier for that business. It doesn't necessarily have to be one source table, but it does need to have some sort of unique properties to it. If we wanted, we could have combined product and category together. It's just a good example for simplicity purposes. Now the primary key is a hash key. And the really key to this is that from that hash key, you can actually reverse the hash and find out what the original business key is. So it, it really serves two things. It, it serves for a primary key in place of maybe in your dimensional model would be a surrogate key. And it provides an, an ability to reverse engineer the key to the table. So you always know what that original value was because of the hash. Now for a link, you would have link business keys similar to the hub business keys. And this might be the relationship between two or more hubs. So the example we saw had a link between product and category, but you might have something like co order, customer, employee. You might have three hubs, and now that you have actually more than just the one relationship between them. You actually have three relationships to that particular link table. I've seen it done both ways. I think it's a personal preference. The bigger deal is the size of your system. So if you're looking to do this full in all your systems, then it, it depends on how much you want to manage. You have a tool to manage it. It's real easy, but if you're having to manage it in your own code, it becomes difficult. And so our, our hub and our link only really value from the business in there is the key. There, there are no other columns related to data that you might report upon. All that's put in the satellite. You know, it's the primary key from the hub or the link. So in the case of the hub, we, we uh, hash the business key. In the case of the link, we hash the business keys and produce the link. Plus, we have the hub key inside of them. And then we create these links from those primary keys, whether it be on a hub or a link. It's the details of the hub and link. And there could be more than one satellite per hub or per link, depending on how you want to split out the data. I know a big deal was the GDPR that came out. So you can actually create a satellite with just GDPR data and secure it just for those people who need to see that, whether it's healthcare information or personal information of an individual. And of course, the, the big key is that you can have multiple tables. You don't have to have one satellite. And we'll look at more of the details between this. So let's jump into a demo of looking at the data that we've created so far. So now we're in SQL Server Management Studio, and we're basically taking the hub for product and we're joining it with one of the satellites. So we see here, we've got our hash key for the product. We've got the product ID, which is our business key. We have the category ID, which is the relationship to category. And then we have the product name. Now, let's see if we have another satellite to join to. So I'm going to go back into here. And lo and behold, you'll see we have, we've already joined to the L ROC, which is the one that doesn't change frequently, to the medium one. And we'll add that relationship to there. And you can see it's pretty much a pattern that uh, gets added here. And basically, we're joining on the hash key, which is just like kind of a surrogate key in the dimensional world. So it's very easy to add additional items here. And then we're able to place those particular values inside of here, like the quantity per unit and the, um, what's the next one, the unit price. So now we're building, if you can kind of tell, um, from our data vault, and which is our, our hub, the H, and our satellites, we can actually build here a dimension. So there's no reason that we can't lay on top of the data vault a um, kind of a virtual dimensional model. And as we go further into talking about data vault, you'll eventually get to what's called an information mart or a business um, business mart or um, more of a business vault layer where 
once you build this and you can see it coming it's going to explode in size you're going to have some parts of it that are going to run slower than others so first you create a view to try to view you know to kind of encapsulate this sort of information so i mean in here we could pretty much create um dbo dot vw you know product we could actually have something like this or if we don't even want to call it a view you know we might call it a dim product and so now we can actually use that particular um i forgot the view we can use that now to just query the database and not necessarily have to write that particular code and really this all depends on what your business is asking for the the product and category might be not be the case for that but in this example that that's what we're using now what I what I want to show here is I'm just going to copy this to our next query windows I'm gonna build it from scratch this time from the actual um, category so I'm gonna go for the category actually use DV as my schema so here's my hub category I'm gonna alias it inner join with the DV dot satellite for category and I'm just gonna call this CS on CS dot you guessed it the hub hash key <laughs> C dot uh, hub hash key so I got that started I'm just gonna put the ID here for now just to make sure my query is correct and um, what I might want to do is go to the satellite and grab the name here now you'll also notice here there's actually a change hash so inside of your hubs or actually your satellites is an additional column called change hash so what it's done is it's hashed all the satellite attributes that relate to the business the, so the next time you go in to try to insert stuff you can actually compare by the hash the change hash rather than the actual column names which becomes very very uh, useful later on I'm, I'm gonna comment out or take the comments out of this and add um, some of these other columns and what you'll see is in our hub you know we have the category ID we have the hash key but we have three additional columns a create date a load date and a source date and if you can guess it we can create another um, system maybe east wind and pull categories from a separate source but yet have it within the same hub and satellites we might even spin off a separate satellite for the east wind data versus the north wind data so you can see the structure of these hubs uh, links and satellites are very very flexible especially because you're using the satellites for most of the detail it does become you know f more full with tables but if you understand the hub link satellite um, you know theory behind it you'll see how easy this is to structure so we just created a relationship between those two now if we wanted to go a step further you know what you're looking at is the from dv link so now I'm pulling in the link for product category and I can actually inner join and you notice here I'm not doing left or right join it's actually an inner join um, to category and we'll say c on c dot hub and then equals the lp c dot guess it hub category so we could do both of these joins very very easily by just knowing that inside of each one of the hubs is a hash key that is also within the link table so now I'm saying LPC and I got my uh, cat uh, product category now what we didn't look at earlier was that that link does have its own hash you can see it here and if you wanted to you could include in the link the actual link business keys in this case it did not but that doesn't mean you can't put it within the um, uh, satellite of the the link so now you can see we've got the category and that joined you know the product has the product ID the category has the category ID and if we wanted to go a step further then we need this inner join which is a, it's just a pattern here 
that now I could easily add the category name. And so now I've joined that link to the, hat, the hub of the category, the hub of the product, and included it with the satellite. I could do the same thing with the product. Very, it's, it's a simple pattern that's um, consistent throughout here. Um, let me copy it from our previous query, maybe space it out, and now I could place the um, products pl dot product name and pm dot quantity per unit. And now I've just joined and created through the link between the product and the category a another dimension table. This could be the actual product dimension where it actually in integrates the category stuff in it as well. And if you remember, we had these dates, um, these uh, product date, these um, source and so forth. So let me let me do that to the category again. So we got that create date, load time, and source. So in the in the world of dimensional modeling, you might look at a slowly changing. Well, here you can have slowly changing or not. So if we go insert a new row, let's say um, we go to category, edit it, um, add, um, I'm just going to call it miscellaneous for now. That's my, my category. And now let me go run that load for it. So I'm going to load my category again. And I'm going to load my stage for that category. And then I'm going to go to my hub again, load that, and I get one new record. And now if I go into um, that select I just had, remember we have here we have eight records, and I just I'm just gonna run that that hub link again. And I, I still have eight records. What I forgot was also I need to run the satellite. So let me do the satellite. I can even do the link if I wanted to, but I don't think I'm gonna get any new records because there's not a new product yet in there. But there's my ninth row for that for that miscellaneous. And I've got the two dates there. And you can see here too also, like for instance here, I have grains slash cereal. Say for instance, you know, I want to change that from, you know, one to just be grains and then to add a new one for cereals. And now let me do that same load again, load categories. I'm going to load my staging. I'm going to update my hub, and then I'm going to update my category. And now, inside of my select again, i got a new one for cereals, and then also I've got two in here for five. There's a grains, and there's a grain cereal, and now they, have, they should have different dates on them to, to separate them. So here was the original one, the original grained cereals. Here's the new one for cereals. And then that was the miscellaneous that added. So these two are the original ones, and then these are the current ones. And of course, when I'm loading anything related to that, then it only shows those particular ones. If I go, you know, if I go back to that um, that query on um, joining them, since those aren't in there yet, you're not going to see them. You'll only see the ch the changes. So it'll still have from the original products related to the grains and cereals, and we don't have any. But, well, here's some grains because now there's a new set of rows related to it. So this would be like a current view of it if you wanted to use grains. If you want to use grains without the grain cereal, but you also still have the storage of it as grains slash cereals. Now, the last thing here is let's look at the code behind this. So here is, um, and it's all pattern based. So in your staging area, you're actually adding your additional columns like your hash for the change, the record source, the load date, and the create time. The actual population of that hash key for category has a, this is all T-SQL from SQL Server, but it could be any ANSI SQL that you use. And there's my, my ability to hash it. And it's pattern based. So this is something that could be used throughout all of them. We have the loads, we have another for the change hash, and then I commented out because I don't want to show, um, I don't want to have to do a declare here, but we got the record source and the, lo and the load date 
from the load table. So here's a select statement, which is all pattern based for here, and it, it could be it could actually be automated to generate this code. You know, that's the insert, and then you could have different uh, syntax for the update. So back to the slides here. Let's talk a little more about the attribute types. Um, really, uh, because it's metadata driven, you want your data warehouse and your agile development to be pattern based where you can duplicate things um, very, very easily. You want to, to divide this stuff up in the, in the types that would help uh, severely. So in a hub, we need a business key. In this example, you see product ID, but it could be product name. It's any unique value or values so you could have more than one column for your hub business keys if needed um, but that this is your metadata you're assigning the attribute type business key to the source product ID this is unique in your business and you might have to identify it with the business leaders or whoever your subject matter expert is but it, it needs to be identified you know uh, the, the big thing that comes on is with uh, a new system comes online and we're wondering if we can integrate this. A lot of times uh, that product ID is different, but maybe the product name is not the same um, because they change the way it, it words. Um, there's other ways to, to put that together. There's these links that are called uh, as of, so you can, um, you can create links and it has to be business provided that relates the business key from one system to the business key of another system and then your views can integrate that together to bring it together which you you got to think about inside of these types <clears throat> is that you want to look at inserting data only you don't want to update any data that's why you saw that hub only has the hub identifier that uh, one or more columns that identifies the business object and you only have to insert it one time if the name changes that's in a different table that's in the satellite and so you could have fully audible and you saw that when we changed the grain slash cereals to grains and cereals is that you could actually still look at it as like a, a slowly changing one where you use whatever the current value is inside of there that ha that name though is hashed or that ID is hashed so you can reverse engineer it and get the value original value back from it so if you ever lose that business key God forbid <laughs> inside of your data warehouse you can reverse engineer it so I've done a lot of dimensional modeling and sometimes we forget about that we just put a surrogate key in there and uh, we use that to identify everything but then you got to trace back to the source system in order to figure out, hey, did I really insert that right for a particular order? But in here, you're storing those hashes in the hub satellites and links, which can be <laughs> reverse engineered or unhashed. And then you know at that time of insert what that value in the, in the program actually was. Same thing with the satellites. So the satellites do have attributes. In our example here, we say and there's a me medium volatility for the um, name, ID, and so forth, but you want a one satellite per type. So if it's a if it's a particular system or it's a particular group of columns. So for instance, here it, it's kind of like the the um, the uh, root of the product. But then again, in the satellite, we only want to insert it once. You'll see this pattern uh, again and again is. This is inserts only. Guess what that does? If you don't have any updates, then the inserts are faster. You're always inserting. You could structure the indexes, primary keys, clustered index, non-clustered index, all based on inserts only into these tables. But sometimes these types are, de are determined, the satellite types are determined of the frequency of change. So if you don't want the values or you know the values are not going to change product name supplier category in this case then you could put it in a less frequently changed satellite now you, when new data does come in from a separate system the new system is feeding the data so that becomes an additional satellite you know, some people might try to merge these together and when you're doing data vault and even in dimensional modeling or iman um, you really want to look 
at how the data is coming in, what the business has done to feed the new system, and does it need to be brought together? A good rule of thumb is to have like hard business rules versus soft business rules. And these are your hard business rules. This is what is coming from the system. The good thing about Data Vault, if you follow the Data Vault fully, it's fully auditable. So anyone could come in and find out what went on the system, when and where. You can use lead and lags for these date and times. And you have that source column that tells it what source system it did come from. It's interesting that I was in a, a, a data warehouse project with a bank and um, two systems merged together. And at first they wanted some of that stuff together. But what I saw was within two to three months of the other system being fully implemented, the business users themselves had already done all their analysis on the old data, put it in their own temporary tables or computationals or models like um, um, like uh, deterministic type modeling for their, it wasn't called machine learning, it was really statistics. But once they had that in there from the old data, they seldom looked at these columns that were just a little different between the two systems. That was just my experience in the bank. But if you're a good T-SQL writer, you can create views to merge this stuff together. So don't be afraid when a new system comes in to actually have something separate from it. You don't, don't try to um, tool it into the existing ones. If something's different, like the product name or the product ID, maybe they don't even have a product ID and they just have a surrogate key and they didn't identify it like that. Plus, you're in that new system and they don't even let you put the product ID from the old one in there. They just let you do a product name. What you can go back on the businesses is you've got to provide me a list of where these match one to one and put it on the business and not on yourself. So the other satellite is the link satellite. We saw this with the product category. Items do change. You have the same ability there to um, select the type of satellites that's going on the link. Again, insert only. Remember, you're looking at these hub satellites and links that all you're doing is straight inserts. Your updates become additional rows in the satellite when, say, a category name changes or it's split like we did but it always keeps what it originally was at that time. In our example in this link satellite, we put into the satellite for product underscore category, the units of stock and on order. So that was more of a quote, transactional thing inside of the satellite, or in this case, an inventory type thing, which we didn't want it on our product hub satellites. We wanted it on the link satellites. You also can see that we eventually are gonna to need to integrate a supplier into here. So the supplier is not on the product category. It's actually going to be in a product underscore supplier. And so now you've separated and extracted what um, would uh, uh, otherwise might be integrated into the dimension. And then all of a sudden something changes with a new um, supplier and they're, they're a new uh, source system and they don't even have supplier related to their product. It's in a whole nother separate area with a whole transactional type system. So you might discontinue it in your, in your uh, new old system and then use the new system for, for new particular data. Again, we're going to hash the key. The hub still has that business key, so we never lose that. The product ID gets copied in there. But we're not looking at anything with a surrogate key, even though you can add one if you'd like, if that is a um, requirement on the business side. And of course, you can structure the views to use the surrogate key if you wanted to. But the good key, the good thing about this hash key is you can always recreate it. So you know, in your, your agile development, you're inserting, 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 but you can always look back and see exactly what is going on. It's good for de debugging problems. I know that no one ever has that problem <coughs> when writing their ETL. And it also does uh, a good thing for consistent code. So what you're doing here is you're simplifying the code. You're using it as more of a pattern base and the automation to generate the code becomes easier and easier. So now let's go on and look at a little more demonstration of using a data vault and we'll do an additional sprint and look at some of the code that might be used. So back in SQL Server Management Studio, we're going to look at some of these queries. So just to give you a heads up right now, um, the uh, 
there's three areas that we're looking at here. Um, one is the load area. So when we're bringing data in, we're loading it. Now this is an, an example of this um, this particular data vault. Um, your load doesn't necessarily have to be a, a quote staging area. It's basically the source data, which in this case is the category ID and category name with the addition to a column of where the source is, north wind, and a load date. These two columns in themselves can be hard coded in a view or if you CDC or replicate data then you can create views on top of that to feed your data vault. The important one is the staging area and all data vaults should have a staging area and you could have that record source and load date in the staging area if you want and actually I believe the 2.0 says that that is where you should have it. In addition there's a creation time. So the creation time is right now because that's when we're loading this particular data. Also when you're going from the source and in this case load to the stage you're also calculating the hub hash key which is the hash or whatever the business key whether it be category ID or category name and then you're also doing a hash to see if something has changed. So in our case the business key is category ID, the data or attribute is category name, so our hash for the change is on category name. So that's our load and our stage which prepares the data for the straight insert which is going to go into our hub category and then also our satellite category. So we get this data and it seems excessive mainly because category only has two columns really the ID and the name, but you can see how beneficial this is if it's a set of larger uh, amounts of data. So let's look at what we're doing here. So in order to insert into that hub, I'm going to go grab stuff from stage. I'm also doing a distinct on those stages. I commented out the date just because there's a, a declare variable there, but we could put the, the current date in there if we'd like. But basically it's going in and it's saying, let me go find all the existing categories. Um, let me go find the existing categories and then join it where I'm actually doing a where not exist, where the stage is not equal to the hub. So for instance, you don't need to stage all data all the time. You can only stay, you can produce it where it's only staging what's new or what's been updated. It's up to you at that level of ETL where you're going. But what we're producing here is an insert. I can do my select distinct here now and I'm, I'm not going to get anything because everything exists in the database. Same thing for the link. The same exact items except in the link what we're actually joining on is the combination of the two hashes. So our link if you remember, let's, uh, let's go ahead and just do a select star from it, db.l. It's got the hash of the product and the category, and its primary key is the, the hash of those two combined. It's not this plus that, it's actually the two business keys to produce that particular value. But we're still doing the search on um, the hub hash keys which are part of the combination could be your primary key if you didn't pick a uh, a hash for the actual link row but it's basically the same thing I mean we're doing a distinct and we're seeing where it doesn't exist and in our case it doesn't exist anywhere the satellite is a little more complicated mainly because you have one area here that's looking at a version so in the hub and the link, we're doing straight inserts, right? So you're saying, okay, I'm doing straight inserts, but how do I know it ends if I don't have a end date? Well, your start date from the previous row will tell you that. So here's a query on my satellite category MC, MROC, and I'm doing a lead on that load date, which really that should have been 
the start date over partition by the hub, the hub hash key, which is part of the key. In a satellite, your key is actually a combination of the hub hash key and the date. I'm ordering it by that start date and calling that my end date. So what I get is a null for all end dates that don't have a next version of the the particular row. So if you remember from the previous demo, we changed grain slash cereals to grain and then we added the cereals row. So you'll notice here we do have some and a miscellaneous. So we added the grain, we added the miscellaneous, and we split the cereal at this point. We still have in our existing grain cereal. You'll notice too that the hashes are the same because it's by the category ID. So we modified the name of a particular category ID. The newer one has a version 2 and because of that lead function I can grab the date, consider it my end date because it's the start of the next version. So don't feel that you just because you're inserting a start date and no end date um, you can't just do inserts only. Some people might say, well, I want to use an update and update the date. And if you want to, that's fine, your discretion, but you don't have to. You can T-SQL Windows functions all this particular data for you. So we're grabbing that version number. We're looking at that stage table. Select distinct from the stage. But now we're doing a left outer join on a grouping of that satellite. So we're looking at that hub, that start date, and that DS version. And this is all our satellite information. Um, and it's all on that particular first row that we inserted. Now we're doing a left join on this because if there's anything in the stage that's not already exists, we want to insert it. But what we're also looking to do is to insert anything that has a hash key difference. So here we have a where not exists where everything pretty much matches up. So if none of these match up, start date, hash, or the hub, hash, so I'm, well, I'm talking about two hashes, the hub link hash, as well as the change hash. So all those are equals here because we're doing a not exist, and that'll bring us all new rows. Now if I, if I run this just to select, I'm probably not going to get any data inside of here, correct. So let's do this. Let's switch it over to our design area. And let's go into our category. And we're going to say, let's insert a new source. So we have a new source in here. It's called Eastwind, not Northwind. And we're going to grab the categories to make it um, part of a uh, system that has two sources. Now, I did that wrong in the design. Let me start all over. What I want to do is I actually want to add a new one called Eastwind here. And then I'm going to add my source mappings and then grab that category again. So now I have two different sources that the data comes from. And they're from the same structure. They're just different databases. So as I flow this through the process, so I've just added something. Really what I should have done was um, made a copy of this first. I should have um, quick copied this to Sprint 2. And for speed, I'm just going to go ahead and generate my vaults from here again. I must call it Sprint 2. And it's going to take that new source, add it to my existing one. You know, I'm just, I'm just adding a new source. I'm going to take that one, create my load and stage from it. Again, this is my sprint two. And now really all I'm doing is adding a new source to category. So exist the first one, I was bringing everything in from just the north wind. Now I'm bringing something in from an east wind database. And what I'll notice is before I had a, a, a stage for um, stage category north wind which brought it from that default source and now I have one from east wind and I got it from a source so now my staging has an east and a north wind and then my load tables I'll have load category 
uh, north wind and down here I have load category east wind and then my hub for category my hub here from category still has two different source mappings but now it's pointing to the load rather than the source and my satellites have been split into two so here's my satellite for category name from north wind and category name from east wind now this is a very simplistic example but it gets the whole thing uh, to the stage that we really want it so I'm, I'm doing my sales sprint to I'm gonna bring it all the way over to my SQL Server database here I can tell it where to place um, items which a lot of the stage is going to be brand new but I like to put them in their own schemas so I've created schemas for stage load and DV is the actual data vault and I can actually call it my sprint to if I wanted to back one out then I know which sprint to do that to I'm going to remove one mapping here and send it on its way so now I've created a whole new and designed another sprint I'm going to actually push it into my automation area which is going to generate new code for that particular um, new staging so here we can see there's some new items in here this east wind connection with the staging has been split up as well as the um, satellites now so we have two satellites but there's no reason we can't combine that data together into a sales because all we have is one hub so the hub has the column for the record source indicator whereas the, the, the two satellites are pointing to different two different areas so the, it shows two examples one is first you can do multiple source mappings in a data vault and the second is that you can actually separate the satellite information because you might have a new source system that has a completely different area so let's go to our sprint to and we're going to load our categories and you'll notice here we have a uh, load for east wind and we have load for north wind we have our staging for east wind and we have our staging for north wind now if i go to my hub and i right click and i load my hub my hub category has no new records so there's nothing new inside of that east wind that would have added either one and I can actually execute each one individually and see if any of those categories um, come in there and in this case none of them do so I can go add that and and see what happens so let's go over here to East Wind and let's go to tables and categories and let's edit this and let's say um, um, East Food so I've added a category to my East Wind food. And if I go to that load categories East Wind, I have 11 rows instead of 10. I'm going to go ahead and stage that 11 rows. And now I'm going to load my hub. And I should have seen at least one row in there. And I don't for some reason. Oh, there it is. One new record. And then the other one should have zero records and I'm going to go to my link which doesn't have any updates because there's not a product associated with that new category yet but I'm going to go ahead and load that east wind um, uh, the east wind satellite and if I go do the north wind here you can see 11 records but if I go do the north wind I notice that I only have 10 records inside of there so <clears throat> if we go down we have a new satellite that has that particular data in it and uh, what I can do here is um, say select star from and it's not going to come in because I need to refresh my local cache DV dot satellite and now I have that south wind or east wind and here I can see that veggies was one of them that was new but the one I added was east food so now instead of having one satellite on our category we now have two that particular one is still out there but what we've done here is actually added one called north wind and now we have a north wind and an east wind so this shows you 
how you can you can you can get two different source systems and then combine that data together the hub is the same so I mean if we go to that hub so um, if I go to the hub I have a, an 11 down here you can see my source is east wind so for instance if I go try to um, let's just create a new query window here use pass go and if I say select from DVH category and I do an inner join to my uh, DV dot um, east wind and I'll say SE on SE dot I need to get that hub hash key as well as the C dot hash key and I'll put a star on there and I get 11 rows but if I try to do it also with the north wind north wind any any I do both of those I only get 11 so in this case I do have to use left joins just to make sure I get all my data and now I've got that east wind and I can combine these together um, there are two different source systems but yet I can use the same generated code uh, to view it so that's a good look at what we what we you know want here as a load which has our source and our date then we have a stage which includes the creation date and a hash change so if something changes it sees the, the it compares the hash rather than uh, column to column and then we can see the different hubs satellites and links that it produces with some code that looks at kind of how do I go from stage to my hub how do I go from the stage to my link and then eventually how do I populate my satellite which gets a little more complicated and mainly because of our change hash here we're looking at the change hash and not just that the column by column so so far we spent a lot of times looking a lot of time looking at the hubs and the satellites we didn't spend a lot uh, with the links yet other than to say that it's a relationship uh, between two hubs and so um, in our diagram here you can see in the center um, almost like a star schema is the link which in our case is customer employee order and we have three blue hubs around it employee order and customer and they have various satellites some of them are in the order we got two different satellites for order we actually have one on employee and one on customer and then we actually have a transaction satellite link um, that is uh, related to the customer employee order so what do we look at when we're talking about a link um, between uh, hubs that are it's more than just a relationship between say product and category in this case it's something for an order so we have instead of business keys you have link business keys and usually this is a combination of the hub business keys now some people just go ahead and uh, create a transaction one just like a fact table and just populate it with all the, the related quote dimensions uh, that might be on here now you can do that or you can even do um, a order to employee an order to a customer an order to an order line item and actually have a relationship for each one that that kind of predicts that you're gonna have a different source system that's going to come in there but if your reporting says you know I'm always have a salesperson the salesperson is going to be an employee and we got to sell it to a customer then you can create one of these links that combine it now the one thing that um, differentiates this from your product category is you might have something called a link dependent child and it's an additional column for uniqueness so you might say well I know I've created fact tables in the past and they told me to use all the surrogate keys from the dimension tables <laughs> but it never makes it unique there's always a duplicate I can't use it as a primary key well in this case you can add something like order line number if it's an order line um, 
link that you're creating the transaction and call it a link dependent child and that combination with the hashes make each row unique you could even make it where the order ID and that order line number is unique but the whole premise of these hub link satellites is that the data you're putting in here is inserts only you uh, kind of expire one record and put in another you don't even expire it because you're not updating it by putting in another row with the same uh, hub or the same hash key you're telling it that this is a different row it's of a new version you can increment it with that is null that's in your insert statement and now you have a new version the versions all the current version it's always the largest number and um, that's your satellite your link and your hub are still straight inserts you would only insert a new row if something totally new comes in here and we looked at the additional columns uh, with the dates and source and there, there's the other one which is the change hash which we'll look at a little more but if you look in this example you can see we use customer ID as well as order ID as the link business keys but if you notice an employee we have last name first name so there's nothing to say that you can't use multiple columns for uniqueness now I know in the employee table you might have first name last name is the same for multiple employees I know that I'm just using this as an example if you really wanted to get detailed you might even add the employee ID to here as that link dependency child um, in the in the case of the link not in case of the employee but we're just using this for simplicity purpose to show that yes you can use multiple columns for your hash key what are those additional columns well they're they're for tracing you know they, they it varies between entities so a hub and a link and a satellite has a little variation to it the, the key to the hub and the link is to have that load date that create time as well as the system that it's coming from remember you're creating something that's fully auditable it's agile so you can constantly add new stuff to it without affecting anything in the past and you can still do views for your slowly changing two your slowly changing three I'm not sure if you could do a slowly changing five or six haven't tried that with a view yet and you might be saying okay well that's fine I can differentiate my systems I can audit it it's gonna get slow no problem with a data vault there's something called a business vault so initially you create your views that give you the concept of selecting either current data meaning the, the next the, the last version of everything or you could do something as of so you can create views where you pass a date in and the view can tell you what the system looked like at that date now I didn't know this existed and when I was at a bank we made a snapshot each day of what the um, loan system looked like the problem with that it got up to about when I left there it was probably 1.7 terabytes tons and tons of duplicate data if you look at this and you think oh wow I could have done that with a slowly changing but a lot of people don't know when the slowly changing happens this guy is just tracking it when something changes remember you could tell your satellites to split up to multiple satellites low volatility medium volatility high volatility in a transaction system there's not a lot that changes maybe day to day you might get a payment and then the balance changes or some sort of incremental uh, interest rate that's changing but or that's that's uh, increasing each day or it might even be constant <laughs> each day but what this does is this simplifies the, uh, the ability to track it day by day and here I can look at what something looked like almost every day of the week if I had that and placed this in there even though there were thousands there's hundreds of tables and thousands of columns if I could have got this built in there I'd have probably saved about two-thirds of space and memory because of the queries they're running and the problem is is the whole system and the business people were actually writing queries against that old data so they were constantly making these uh, model predictions about who's going to you know pay a loan back when they're not going to pay it who should we concentrate on the phone calls and collections with but they are still querying maybe 125 of the thousands of columns if I'd have had this data vault in there, that would have solved all my problems. So let's go look at another demonstration of creating a link table. 
All right, so let's do, let's say we're going to do another sprint. We're going to do sprint four or three in this case. I'm going to sales. I'm going to, um, actually, I'm going to go to the north wind to the 10 version, which is really our sprint one. And I'm going to create a new design. I'm going to go back to my sales and I'm going to call it sprint three. So my sprint three, I'm going to keep the types. But here I'm going to add a order, which is order ID. I'm going to create an employee, which is going to be an employee ID. And then we're going to create a customer with a customer ID. And let's keep that for now. We're going to say next, and we're going to create a link. And this is going to be our customer employee, or actually, let's call it order customer employee. And this will be our order customer employee. We'll click next. We got our link. Now we're going to tell it what our business keys are from each uh, hub that we created. And we're actually bringing orders in here now. And now it's going to ask us for those link dependency child. So I know from my um, from my data that order date might need to be included with the orders in order to make it unique. So a customer and an employee plus that order date would make that particular row unique. And my customers, I'm just going to take off some of the data so we're not reading in everything into here. Um, employee, the same thing. I don't want to put the birth date, even though I could put the birth date, make it a GDPR satellite and, and throw it off to another cut, another area. I know I added that order date as a link dependency child, so you see those two have been removed from there. My shipping information is okay, but the um, the two dates and the freight need to go into my link table. So here I'm going to add that from my orders, freight, ship, and require date, and click next. So now I've created a new area um, for my logical design. You can see the, the links in the middle. I've got my um, three hubs and with a multiple key uh, link table this time. So you're not just um, locked in to doing um, one to one as hubs. So go to sales. I'm going to do it my sprint three. Create. It's going to take what I designed and it's going to bring it off into a new logical model. And so now I've got uh, two different sprints. Here's my, my first sprint. Um, let's go back to, well, well, we'll look at sprint two. So sprint, or sprint, yeah, sprint two is one we updated. So here I've got category, product, and link product category. But in my other diagram, I've got order, employee, customer, and order, each with its own satellites. They all have their own satellites. But if you notice, there is no relationship between uh, those two. So I can go, I can actually go in here and try to merge these together, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do the same sort of loading that we did in the past. I'm going to do my sprint three. And I'm going to generate uh, the load and staging for it. And I'm actually going to port that into my automation tool that will generate the code and populate uh, this particular data. So all this um, is being generated by the metadata kept for these. And basically the metadata is that area that says, oh, look, this is a link hash key. These are hub hash keys. That's my business keys. And then these are my different um, uh, hard hard rules that are in the hubs, cat, uh, satellites, and links. So I have a set of columns that help for the tracing and auditability. But basically, each one of these, even the table now, 
has a particular table type, which is now metadata about it. So in the background, I'm building this metadata where this existing script engine can go look at the metadata. And because it's pattern based of data vault, it could generate this. Same thing could be done for dimension effects, but it gets a little more complicated with like slowly changing and um, when you want to generate like this link dependency child. There's some automation you could do from it, but it's a little more limited in, uh, in the space for that. So now let's go ahead and just see if we can't get this whole thing uh, deployed. And I'm basically creating a system from all that metadata to tell it where to go. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm setting my uh, areas from DV to stage and to load. And if I want, the automation could do this for me. It can go look at the first couple characters or I could look at the metadata of the entity type and figure out which um, particular um, target it wants to go to. And now I'm tracking it by sprint. And I could tell what was added with each sprint. I need to remove one little checkbox here. Go next, next. The good thing about the Nexus in this case of this automation tool is that it means that everything was successful and I didn't get an error, which is nice. I'm going to uh, I'm a go to that Sprint 3, send it to my automation tool. It's going to run. It's going to look at all that metadata. And in this case, everything is new. So we should see news created, and then we should see um, all the tables created, all the indexes created. All this is pattern based because of data vaulting, the fully automation, and then it generates the code for it knows what load is. Load is a one to one with the source system, other than the column for the source and the column for that load time. The stage needs to calculate those hashes, so it's got to generate the SQL to, to create those. And then the hubs, satellites, and links has that special code because you're doing inserts only to test to make sure first that it's not a new row in the stage and second that it doesn't match an existing row and need to be inserted because the change hash has changed which means the change hash has the columns that are being read into the satellite and is a hash created for them so I'm gonna go refresh my my display here and I'm gonna go to my load and I've got a bunch of new loads now because I've done my sprint now I only see the things that are related to that particular sprint, which is nice because then I can customize or um, automate all this stuff. I'm running them manually, just going to want to make sure nothing uh, bombs. And if it bombs, I want to stop right there. But I'm going to go ahead and populate all these because I'm overly confident <laughs> that it's all going to work, um, especially in this case. And I'm, I'm updating all my hubs, all my links, and all my satellites. And now I've got this nice new um, set of uh, spokes, uh, in this case, for order customer employee that I didn't have with the previous one. So the previous one was product and categories with the link. We did some satellites and a multi-source. And then this one is a whole separate one in a separate sprint. So you can imagine uh, developer A is doing product and categories. Developer B is doing um, order customer employee and they're doing two separate development paths into the same system with the same automation tool just working in two different parallels you need to put it together with that order lines between order and product we haven't got to that point yet but now you see that we've gotten all this data inside of there and I'll create a new query here I'm gonna call it 21 cust employee order and I'll go to that database what I'll need to do is refresh the IntelliSense. And I can say select star, and I'll just do it straight line, db dot, um, well, didn't want that, <laughs> h customer, select star from db dot h employee, which really, this is my sales person. So we're, we're sticking with employee as the name because it fits the source system. We're, we're looking at hard rules and we're making sure that our raw vault has all the existing stuff in it as it came from the source system. But when we go display this to the business intelligence developer, 
we're going to want to change those names for them. So we'll do a select star from dv.orders. And we also have a select star from, what do y'all think this is going to be? I wish I had some user interaction here, right? The link. So there, there's my customers. There's my employee customers, my employees, my orders, and then my order line. And you can see the three customs. Now the, the hash here, it looks blank, but it really isn't. It's just not displaying good in, in SQL Server Management Studio. But now I've got my hubs uh, for all those orders, my link dependency child, which is the order date, my record source, load date, and creation time. And then, of course, I've got the other, the other tables, which are my satellites. So the satellite customer, employee, and that transaction. So in this case, we got a required date, a ship via, and a freight. So that's one of our satellites. There should be uh, another one. Oh, no, we removed all the ship, which we should have. We should have created another one for that, but we, we excluded that. We'll do that later on um, and add it in addition. So we'll do another sprint and add it. Oh, here it is. M, M, no, the orders. Did I put in the orders? Yeah, ship, ship information. So here is our ship information. Uh, the, so the satellite took the required date, ship via and freight so we know those three things are not going to change um, from row to row we know that's not going to change but it's possible that the shipping information might change maybe the ship date and ship required date and ship via might change i'm just using this as an example as the link satellite is less likely to change than the actual satellite on the order and i was able to separate those from the hubs orders versus the um, link in there. So we got that. We could join these together by those hub hash keys. We can do the same logic we did inside of the product category when we sorted on that um, on that uh, version number where we added or we changed an existing row. All that same stuff can be added here. Next thing we need to do is they'll combine it all together with that central order line number. All right, so we finished up with some more about links. Looked at a multi, more than two hub created link. And now uh, we'll talk a little bit more about satellites and we'll do a little more uh, merging of what we've created together. So um, the attribute types for satellites really are the changing attributes. So when we look at a link and when we looked at a hub, we were mainly looking at that business key, which shouldn't change. Um, if it does, um, then there's some something's happening in the background in the business application. Um, and that would take a whole lot more work to update any data warehouse in that case. But the attribute type for a satellite really is what's changing, you know, like um, the first name or last name, or maybe the last name of a customer or Maybe the um, uh, maybe the employee has changed addresses. So when you think of satellites, you're thinking of columns that change. You're not thinking of anything that's related uh, to the business key or in the case of a link, a link business key. Um, but even if something does change and it inserts a new row, we still have a historical tracking of that particular order. And we'll look later about bridge and pit tables where we can create some um, as of a certain date the value or um, you can look at the current stuff and we'll look at individual views that can be created for that and, and you see I'm sure you're getting the the gist of this um, it, sometimes it's difficult because the dimensional modeling is so easy to just create that fact dimensions around it surrogate key and the simplicity of it makes it easy to visualize and comprehend um, your your data vault and really the, the whole point of this is some sort of agile de development if you're changing something from a slowly changing one to a slowly changing type two there's a lot of internals that you have to do to restructure the tables and what you've seen in ours is the or what you've seen in a, a data vault so far is the hub has the business key and the link has the business keys and those shouldn't change and you're not adding any of these quote changing attributes 
to the hubs and links. You're looking at satellites, and when something does change structurally, you can always spin off another satellite. Now you might be saying, well, then I, then I have to combine it later on. I'm, 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 from experience, I'm seeing that that's not really the case, and really good T-SQL developers should be able to formulate views to handle that sort of thing. So in these changing attribute, your value could change. And again, when we do these satellites, and you can see it over in the right with this customer employee order transaction, we have the DSS change hash. So what we're doing is we're creating a column that's taking like the freight and the ship via, and it's hashing those together, putting them in there. And we have two columns here, but you could have 10, 15, 20. And now when the value does change, you're comparing the hash and not the individual um, the individual columns that changes. You also could spin off satellites by different areas. And uh, we saw this, we had an east wind and a north wind database. So we spun those off together. Another common one that's come up a lot is when you get into regulation. And so certain columns need to have more security on them for a table. So you spin off a satellite off the hub and you put the GDPR type columns inside of them. Now, in this case, you know, it, it also can depend on the, the change rate. We, so we saw a low volatility, medium, and a high volatility. So you can actually create satellites based on the, the idea of how often they do change. You still run into the issue where maybe one of the five columns changes and now it enters a new record for all five. But you can help split us off. And in a, a development agile world doing it, the satellites is a whole lot easier than if it was embedded inside of the hub dimension link or fact table. Um, so in our case, you know, the, the ship data might be different than the order data. So now we have two separate spots. The order dates, order information changes less frequently than the ship does, but we have two separate ones and we can always create a view to combine them together. And then of course, we've talked about the GDPR and other regulations. Um, like um, uh, healthcare information, um, anything that you need to apply a different security level on site. Um, also, in, in, in SQL Server, this is really nice when you can create those masks. So you might want to have a satellite that's masked column. So you push in, uh, the data in there, you apply the data masking to that table, and then when someone queries it, then they only see the mask information. Social security number, birthday, anything personal uh, to an individual. So the other, you know, before we had the business key or the link business key, the combination of those is the unique row inside of a hub and link. You're only inserting row, one row, so you don't have a second row for a particular business key or link combination of link business keys. So you, your, your primary key is pretty set. But in the satellite, you're actually combining the hash key with the date that it was um, started. So your start and your insert date might be the same, but you're going to use a combination of those two columns to um, make it unique inside the satellite. So we're not looking at just the hash key. In this case, it's not the one-to-one. -one, it's actually a one-to-many. And then when you look for uniqueness in your satellite, you're going to combine it with the date. Now, what this does, it gives you total historical tracking. You don't have to worry about slowly changing one, two, or three. Everything is tracked in here by hub hash key plus the date. You might be um, reluctant to create many satellites, but the upfront planning can help. But even in this agile world, if you put them all in there, to split them up is not that difficult. So for me to remove the ship from the information of an order might be easier in this case than it would be another type of data warehousing. But that full audit historical tracking uh, can be so important. And again, uh, the, the, the bank and the loan system I was around, if I'd have known about this back then, uh, we wouldn't have taken that daily snapshot. When you start taking that daily snapshot and you start using an ODS, people start querying it. And they'll start writing a lot of reporting and queries against it. And even though they know um, not many people are using it, they don't want to spend that time to rewrite this stuff. So in your data vault, not only do you have the data the business can query, you're removing them from the ODS and you're applying them to this fully audible database and not creating something else that takes forever to scale out of. Now, um, 
you know, if a new system comes in, your columns might be different. You might not have, in a shipping case, yeah, you might have that, but this new system might track additional information about your order. Maybe it, it's tracking a promotion. Uh, maybe it's tracking a discount that you didn't have in the one previously. So now, instead of modifying the whole system, you just create a different satellite, and you have a satellite for a promotion for the order, and you have a satellite for um, the discount that's applied. So you're not you're not looking to modify the existing satellite that might have the details of the order line item. You'll add a new one, and then you know, of course, you're going to say, well, now I've got all this um, kind of blank data, and there's actually a way to do it. You create what's called a ghost record. And so you take those satellites that say at time today, um, you had data in here since 2000, you can enter a ghost record with NAs or whatever you want to call unknowns as the first row in that order. And then it picks up today with your new system. So there is a way to handle that non-existing data. And what does that do? That eliminates the ability or the, um, uh, the problem with having left joins. So you want to try to make everything as fast as you can. So you're looking to fill the tables where when you join them, you're using all inner joins and not left joins. Now, this is a raw vault where we talk about the um, links, hubs, and satellites. And your business might be uh, interested in um, querying that detail. But you might want to look at creating views to consolidate the data. And the other thing is that they're already used to using a system that has certain, quote, dimension and fact tables. The views can be materialized against these hub links and satellites, thus not uh, having them to hold, rewrite a whole bunch of stuff. You might be able to substitute on it. I know when, when we did that new loan system, our existing dim and facts, it was kind of hard to retrofit it, but we did get it done in about, about two or three months. Even when a new loan system came in and, a, and an origination system, and people were delighted they didn't have to rewrite, say, 50% of their queries. They still had a lot of work to do with the other 50%. And when we noticed with them uh, new reports, they weren't digging in as much historical data as they were looking at more current data. And we saw them slowly go away from combining the two systems and queries to just looking at the current system. The other thing is that they did was they did a lot of historical um, modeling of data and just used that as their forecast. There's also things where we can merge these two together. So we were looking at uh, earlier, uh, we did a product category and then we did a customer order employee, which had no connection in between them. And we had two sprints. They were both pushed to the same uh, data warehouse, but there was no connection between them. So we might want to look at how do we merge these two things together. So in, in the case of here, there's not many relationships that were between those two. And we've got, we need to create a new container for the combination of these sprints. Now, some links might be duplicated and the problem there is um, if you created it two separate ways. So what you want to do is you want to separate it. And in, in, again, we're doing sprint one, sprint two, sprint three. And we'll look at a, an example of what to do and what not to do. But you're going to look at some things that might be de de uh, duplicated. And eventually you want to create um, the link in the master. So you have a master with your sprints and you're just merging those into your master. This is really nice because you could do some incremental builds with this. We saw it where we did product category, did all the loading to the staging, and then we did the customer order employee. And then we even added the east wind to the south wind. And if you notice, the, the satellite was just on that particular customer. Or no, it was on that particular category. And then it actually split into two new ones. And one had the north wind and one had the east wind. And in that case, we, we need to do that um, in order to uh, integrate this new system and do it. So there's no modifications to the existing sprint tables. You don't want to go modify those. You want to create a new sprint and merge it into the existing. So let's go ahead and uh, look at a demonstration of adding an order line link. And we'll see what happens when we try to create it, where we already have the links and hubs created for some of the relationships. And then we'll, we'll practice with some merging of these two things together. All right, so now we're back into our design system. We had that sprint one, which had our category, the link between product 
and category. And then we also had the sprint where we use the order, employee, and customer to create the link for the order, customer, employee. So I want to add the order line to my design. So I'm going to go into my data vault design, or actually I'm going to go to my source, and I'm going to try to create another logical model. I'm going to call this sprint five. Hit create. And um, here, you know, that we're talking about the GDPR. So, I mean, here I could create a GDPR actual satellite and I can uh, use this as part of my process, um, especially with the, the metadata that's stored inside of here. And I could have a new type of satellite added as well. So here I'm going to create my hub. So my hubs in this case are going to be orders, which is order ID and product, which is product ID. Now, I might want to be inclined to one called order details. And here I'm using order ID plus a line number, line item, right? So those are my three hubs. And if I create a link for this for order details, I want my order items with the relationship with order and product. I click next. All right, so maybe I need to call this or oh, order line. Okay, and now I need to create my relationship with order. Go to my order details and get the ID and the line item and then my product. So basically, I'm trying to create a link between those three. And I get to this point where it's active for link dependency children. Now, order, line, order ID and order line is my uniqueness, but they also have has a possibility of product ID being part of that. But we're going to leave everything alone as far as that concerns. But here, what you'll see now is like, oh, wait, I've already created the order somewhere else, and I created the product from somewhere else. I don't remember what I removed and what I created. And then I'm also got two things in here. I'm creating a hub. Um, I'm creating a, a, a um a uh, link which I need the unit price quantity and discount and then on that hub for there I don't want to add those two but I want to keep the product ID and now I'm thinking maybe I don't need that order details in there as a hub so I'm, I'm coming in here and I'm really recreating what already has been created and what I'm going to find is after I create my data vault in this case a sprint 5 I'm going to have a lot of duplicate stuff. Um, and so now I've got to rethink what I'm going to be doing in this case. Um, I need a GDPR. I need a suffix for that in case I'm using it. And uh, it looks good when I when I display it. And once it's created um, and it has, you know, a, a good middle middle ground with my link for order line. And then I got my hubs for product order details and order and I've got a spun off of just this one satellite for order details with the product ID probably I could have added it as a link dependency child and eliminated that satellite but if I go compare it to the other ones um, then I've got some some conflicts here so if I go to that sprint three you know we, we split the order did we split the order up we kept it all in there um, we moved some of the, the stuff out of the order. Um, we moved it out of the order and put it in the transaction, ship via and freight. So now we got we got some confusing things here. We've got additional uh, information. So I'm, I'm in a sprint, you know, and I just posted that out there. And I'm like, you know what? That's probably not what I really wanted to do. So let's look at another method. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go grab that sprint three. I'm going to right click on it and I'm going to create a copy. And I'm going to call it my Sprint 50. I'm just trying to increment this up and I'm going to display it. And I see I have the order line. So it seemed to be meant to me that it'd be nice if I could just drag this particular um, from the source, if I could just drag this order details in here. And then what it does do is it does give me a relationship with the order, in this case, um, it's got a relationship with the order customer employee because I had that order ID. But what I don't see in here is product. 
if I drag product in here now, I don't have the existing um, things that I've set out for the product already. So let's try one more option here. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to close all my displays. And I'm in my design, which is my logical. And I'm actually going to merge these together. So what I'm going to do is, first thing, I'm going to delete this Sprint 50. Um, I know I don't want it. And I'm going to create a new version, maybe Merge 50, call it. And in my Merge 50, I can go grab that Sprint 1 and merge it into there. And it shows me everything's going to be an add. And I'm going to go grab, I believe it was the 3, right? Yes. So I'm going to go grab 3 and go to Merge 50 and merge those in well. You see, add, 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 keep, 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 keep. So there's no conflicts in here between those two sprints. And now I have this merge 50. I want to dis, oops. All right, click and display. And now I've got the merge, but you notice there's no relationship between the two. So what I want now is to be able to grab from that source that order details. And I'm going to drag it out here. And what I'll see, if I straighten out my relationships, or move it up some first, straighten out my relationships, now I can see that order details can have a relationship with orders and product, and now I've merged these guys together. It saves a lot of work here now that it's merged together. I have my original sprints created, and now what I need to do is modify this to uh, have the right um, attribute types. So I'm creating this as a new link. I'm in my logical conceptual design. I want my order line to actually be the link dependency child. And then that unit price, quantity, and discount are going to be my satellite transactions. And as I click OK, I can see the little color codings here. So now I've just added into two sprints that were merged together a new link that brought all this together. Now, I still need to create my, my data vault from this. That's the con conceptual. I need, a, I need a, a visual one for it. I'm going to call it Sprint 50. And it's going to take all my defaults. It's going to process all that metadata about the attribute types, the business key, the link business key, all the satellite associations. And it's going to create me the hubs, links, and satellites I need, just like the previous one, except now we got the details added, but all the other items in here, all my existing satellite hubs are all the same. You know, So what I was able to do here, and, and, and this is what's really nice uh, having an automation tool, is I've taken two sprints, I've merged them together, and then I modified it one step further. So I was able to, to take uh, two people's designs, put it together, and do a, quote, master copy of it all. Now, the other thing I need inside of here before I can display it um, in a system is I need to create our load and stage uh, for this. Call it Sprint 50. It's really, it's really, you know, Merge 50. Let's just designate it as that. And I'm going to run it through my scripts. I'm going to look at all that metadata. It's going to extract the sources, put them in the load table, add the source, uh, the load date, and the record source column. And it's going to create the stages, which gets the data from the load, but does the hashes, the hash keys, the, the hash, that's the change. Then it adds that create time, and it adds one more additional column to the system. And now I need to prepare it so it can be sent into my metadata repository. And basically, I'm cleaning it up for importing into a SQL Server database. Um, let me uh, uncheck a lot of the, uh, let's, let's do it this way. Let's say stage. Let's unselect all. Select stage. Load. Now the rest to my DB, and I'm going to call this my Merge 50. And 
And I've prepared it to be imported into SQL Server. Remember that loading stage, the load doesn't have to be in here. Stage is kind of a, an idea behind Data Vault. I'm pretty sure in every dimensional model that I've used, we've always had staging. Um, but here you can see it as more of a systematic approach to here's my load, which could be the source system. It could be a dumping ground in an ODS for your uh, source systems to do CDC or transactional replication. And then when you load it, and you're successful with your import into your hub satellite links, you can truncate that um, as well. Or you can perform a truncate from within a system yourself. So we got it created. We're gonna go ahead and send this to our, our automation of the imports. And we're gonna see um, this new order line merge together with the um, with the completed. And if we go into SQL Server and we look at that particular database, let me make sure I'm in the right one, the complete. You know what I really love about SQL Server is you can do these uh, schema um, filters. Yeah, so now I just see my DBs, which uh, that doesn't look like the right one. <laughs> Let's see if it's updated. We'll go, we'll go look inside of the system to see the, the correct one. Um, oops. Sorry about that. Should just let this finish. And then be satisfied instead of trying to multitask at the, the same time. I'm surprised uh, the filter didn't work here. Let me remove that and just scroll down. Oh, it's creating them as DBO. So, um, I didn't have the right stuff. Let's see if I can find it created on another one in the demo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it doesn't have the order line. That's okay. All right, so let's refresh this. I have pumped it into the wrong one, but that's okay. I've got a backup as always. Let me just see if I can load the order details and then load. Yep, got 843. Load the details stage. The other one should already have the data in there. I don't need to really update it. There's no new hubs. The only new thing is the links. So I'll update that. Yep. Oh, doesn't look like it added any there. Oh, I'm gonna, I am going to have to do the um, orders as well as the products because there's data between there. And let me stage the order and stage the product. And now when I do my link for order details, I should get my data, which I didn't. But let's, I'm not going to stall out on that. I'm going to uh, continue on. Um, I could look at the code to see what maybe cause that particular problem and grab the stage. It might have it might have the wrong. Let me just check that one second. If not, we'll we'll continue on to the other one. Let's see. Like completed. Okay, here, here it is right here. Like completed. Let's go. I think I got my, um, I've got my schemas confused in that last import. But yeah, I should see it there. Here's my details. It's from my, um, it's from my link order details. And I've got the hub of the product and the hub of the order. And I should also be able to see my satellite from here as well. Order details transaction, and I can join those two together. So now I can create a fact table as a view uh, between these two. And really, what I'm going to look at is not really the hub information, maybe the order ID. And I'm going to say I'm going to use that database. And I am going to, this is my detail 
enter join on db dot uh, order order on the of hash key with the same link of hash key so I should get that get rid of the dupes here you also notice that that order ID is only in that particular one and then I could join it also with that satellite so enter join uh, the DV transactions on T dot um, and in here in this case it's the hub uh, the link um, uh, uh, hash joining to the um, detail of hash. And let's see, I should get a bunch of rows, and then if I wanted to, that I can get that satellite um, transaction information like the discount and the quantity and the unit price. And now I've got that data, and so. Here, you know, we have the hub links to satellites as raw data. Some people are saying, well, I should calculate the total price. Well, why not do it in this additional layer as um, fact order one, right? Create view the as goes here, right? I'm going to create this view. I'm going to call it dbo dot. And I'm going to put my calculation here. So I'm going to cast the quantity times, oops, times the unit price as sales amount. And I could test this first just to make sure. I want to cast it as a money. And I could check it before. I run it. Ut. I uh, need a comma and cast. And I cast it. Cast. 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 As money. My cap. You gotta take that off for now, but y'all get the idea. <laughs> so let's see if that works here. Yeah, so I did my sales amount now in this view. And now I've made a fact table. Out of the hub link and satellite. Um, that really has the same structure as what I would build in a fact table, except the hard business rules are done um, only to uh, help put the data into hubs, links, and satellite. Soft business rules would be like sales amount. So in my fact table, I might already have a sales amount, which is calculated one way. It's calculated different in another way. We found this in our loan systems, where um, like loan to value, um, some of the um, uh, payment uh, to income, some of them were calculated different in different systems. But if we just put the raw data in those hubs, links, and satellites, then we could put the information mark, our data mark, on top of our hub links to satellite. And here's just an easy way to do it where the sales amount is what's considered a soft rule. You don't put it in until it's actually displayed to the end user. You might have some end users pretty smart that could do that themselves from the hub links to satellites, but you might want to keep them away from the raw vault first and put an information mark on top of that. So let's finish up this session talking about the additional columns. These are those hard rules like the start and end date. Again, we had the start being populated through our insert, but the end we really didn't need because the relational database system supports these window functions called lag and leap. So we use those in our views in order to find the end date if a version of the satellite data was needed. You also have the ability to put a ghost record in. That's the probably the starting time of your data. This is in case you add a satellite later in the Agile development and you need to move or at least put a record in there so you can keep your inner joins and you don't need to use left joins. This usually happens when two separate systems come into play. 
and you're getting source data, you can you can try to um, retrofit it into the existing satellite. But a more agile methodology would be to create a separate satellite. And you're not you're not you, you're not destroying any structure at all. What you're doing is just kind of time stamping that that's the historical data. I've got an audit of it, and here's the data going forward. I've seen a lot of people, you know, you eventually they use the, the two systems and try to put the two data together, like one system replace it at another. But usually their reporting is more on the more current stuff. So even having it in a satellite might actually speed up the retrieval of the data. And remember to use this hash change column get the columns that are in the satellite, hash them together, and then when you do an insert, you're checking to see if that row already exists, not only with the key, but also with this change hash, so you know if you need to insert a new row or not. Even if the, you know, the load in the stage includes it again, then you have another check when you insert into your hub or link table, as well as your satellite table. One thing we didn't mention, too, is that the code, there are no lookups. If you notice, because of that hash key and us being able to calculate the hash key, no matter if we're in a hub or link or a satellite, we're not having to, quote, look up the surrogate key. So the inserts are even faster because you don't have that step, which I've done in SSIS a million times with fact tables, of having to look up that surrogate key. So your inserts are extremely faster. This can be calculated. It's in the hub link or satellite. And there's no updates. This is all inserts. So your ETL is very straightforward. And I mean, if you want to call it, this is EL. And then later in our information mart or our business mart, we'll place on top of it views that do the soft rules. You know, you create these virtual views. We saw one with a dimension and a fact table. I believe we did the dimension for product where we combined product and category to the, from the two hubs and their satellites. And then we created a fact for order lines in a view. Now, eventually that'll get um, slower and you might want to do something different with it. Again, one of the soft rules, just to give you context, the hard rules is let's just grab the source and put it in a column, not try to do any sort of transformation between the source and a hub link or satellite. And then here when we created that view, we did the sales amount as quantity times unit price. So our soft rule is, is calculating additional things. I saw this in a loan system where we had like loan to value, um, payment to income, and people calculated a bunch of different ways. Well, we tried to retrofit that into all our fact tables, and it became really a pain, and we ended up having multiple LTVs and multiple PTIs. And this would have alleviated that, because I'd have just populated all the raw data into satellites, and then I could let the business take care of how they want to report those individual measures, as they were so called. But on top of this, once things get a little slow and you need a little more speed, you have what's called a business file. And this starts with the views, and you can see one here is a point in time. It's actually the, the how do I get the data from a particular uh, date. There's a current flag to say, OK, is this the current row of this satellite, or is it a historical one? And we calculate the end date through that Windows function. And it basically has the hash uh, it's, it's basically a view of the satellite with additional information. It's, it's in order to see a current view or an as of view. It's a point in time, and we could use this uh, as well as another one called current to get that particular data. And your current is always slowly changing type 1. And as you can see, you can create views to do slowly changing type 2. So the PID table now from the view is going to be are, are either our hub and satellites or link and satellites. So what you're doing is flattening the keys into a table, putting a snapshot date on it, and then um, hardening uh, particular snapshots of it, whether it be weekly, monthly, or quarterly. And that way, people can go to the pit table rather than trying to do all the joins on the satellite. So this business vault, which is on top of the raw vault, helps you with a point in time, which is one hub link, one hub or one link. You schedule the update, so you have to have something to populate it. It could start as a view, but eventually you want to make the retrieval faster, so you harden it to a table. Or if you can do materialized views inside of, or index views in SQL Server, then you can use that as well, and you can let the relational database management system ha handle it. It's not for all areas. Don't go 
put a bunch of pit tables out there, bridge tables. Use it only when you see performance that is slow. The bridge is more of the link, uh, two links with a related hub between it, and, or, a, or a link with related hubs, and you're flattening the um, you're flattening the hash keys, but no dates, and you're putting the business keys in there as well. So you're flattening this bridge between um, two areas, in this case, product and category. You didn't do in a snapshot, just like you did in the pit table. But you can have one or more links. You always got to make sure if you do two more links, you have to have the hub in there. That's the relationship between the relationship, right? <laughs> it's kind of confusing. Contains a hash and can contain the start key. People also include satellite keys, though it's not in the exact 2.0 format of data vaulting. But here you can see, you can expand it up to be a bridge between commonly queried information. And again, it, you start it with a view, but eventually you want to harden the table and do refreshes on it. That's not all what Data Vault is. There's also other possibilities like a multi active satellite. You have multiple phone numbers for an employee. The system has some unique column like phone type. And instead of doing the spawn enough another hub or another link, you can just create a multi active satellite. So the actual satellite is either a sequence number or this unique code and it's that hash key from the hub or link plus the multi-active satellite key. So eventually what you do is you flag these. It's another metadata attribute. Um, if the system is unique, you can put the type, but if not, you might have to generate a sequence number uh, on your own. So you might just see phone, phone number one, two, and three, and then you got to code it where it actually is comparing the the phone number to see if there was a change in it unless you always want to populate the three phone numbers every time you do a snapshot of it hopefully you have some cdc or replication to handle that in large um, systems but it is that hash key plus your your key good examples of customer customer hub with many phone numbers or many addresses there's also a reference or code table you can have it's basically a lookup it's not a satellite and you just relate it through the foreign key and there's no need for the data warehouse to process it. A good example is a state code with a state name. So you have a fixed set of things. There's nothing changing in the environment. You populate it once as a reference or a code. You relate that to the uh, particular satellite that has the code in it. You wouldn't have it in a hub or link. It would always be there. And it, usually I see this with in, internal reference numbers. So for, is that's supposed to be enum at the end. So your developers have used uh, an enumeration system inside of the language that has one through five for these five statuses, let's say. So a good use of reference or code would be something like state code or an enumeration that's in your product. Don't be limited for what you've seen here in Data Vault. Uh, there's many, many other things that Data Vault can do, including um, as of links, where you have two sets of customer data and you have different codes, but the business provides you a, um, a kind of a translation. Uh, ABC is the same thing as 00, 1, 2, 3. So you have a, um, a bridge between two customer hubs. That's the as of link. So you know which customer, you know, if the same customer exists in both, you have a way to, to identify that for other um, type of link data or transaction data you might have. You might have one customer in the one system and not in the other. So uh, you kind of do a bridge between that so people know uh, between it. So don't be limited by what you've seen in here. Data Vault is wide open. A lot of this stuff can be applied to dimension and facts. And in the Iman uh, methodology, almost all of this can be applied. Um, you just are going to do it in sprints and then eventually you know, delve your, your reference material inside of here. So I want to thank you a lot for attending this session. You can reach me on Twitter at the Smiling DBA. And you can also email me, the Smiling DBA at gmail.com, as well as Thomas LeBlanc.com. I hope you enjoy this past virtual summit 2020, and I hope you're enjoying your day.